the learning aspect of it, you know, we should, as people, never be closed off, you know, to, to learning new things. Hello, intelligent beings of this marvellous planet. Welcome to the 42 Courses podcast and thanks for listening. Louise Ward is the co-founder of the Behavioural Science Club on LinkedIn. Each week, the group speaks to the leading speakers and authors from the field of behavioural science. The club only started in June 2020, but already has over 4,000 members. Louise has been in market research for 30 years, also represents Ireland at the World Admin Summit and is a mentor. And if that's not enough, Louise is also one of the top students on 42 courses currently at sixth position on the global leaderboard all in all an amazing person and one of the nicest people you'll ever meet i'm really delighted to speak to louise ward hello louise hi Bren. thank you so much for inviting me along thank you for your time great stuff so louise um explain to people what you do in your normal everyday life and then we'll get on to behavioral science Super. Yeah, so I'm a market researcher. I've worked in market research for a very long time now. I fell into it by accident out of school. My dad worked in advertising and um, I hadn't got the most spectacular exam results. I was thinking of doing, uh, believe it or not, I was interested in becoming a probation officer. Wow. And my my man, my dad is a man of very few words, never, ever judged anything I've done. But it was the little bit of advice he gave me. He said, Please, it's not the most glamorous job. And he brought home from the advertising agency a book which listed all of the market research agencies in the UK. And I wrote to all of the market research agencies in London and uh, got an interview and got my first job working for a company called Milpro, which was a medical market research agency. And I must say, they gave me a really fantastic grounding. I went into the field office. So there you're right on the ground, as it were, managing yep. the interviewers out in the field. And I've since then always advocated for the concept of moving around departments and understanding what every department did. Because half of the challenge in an industry is that when you join on a graduate program and go straight in at a certain level, let's say junior research exec, not understanding how the work is done yeah. on the ground mm. loses so much subsequent understanding. So I always advocated for that, the, the, the moving about departments and understanding all the people who are working on the ground, exactly what it involves. Wow, really interesting. And, and that was in London, but you've got the map of the world behind you there. Where are you now? Yeah, I'm in Dublin now. We came, my husband is Irish and we came over when my first son was born. So all of my, I have four children brought wow. up, all grown up Irish. Uh, even though uh, they still completely tease me about my accent and my random uh, things that they say, oh, that's so English, mom. Uh, <laughs> they're half English, but they're not English when you grow up in Ireland. <laughs> yeah. There's a very, a very strong Irish identity. Well, you have little inflections of Irish in your accent these days. I've been here nearly 30 years now. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> okay, so, so we are talking because... You, you are a person on the scene in behavioral science. So let's get into that. What, what first got you into behavioral science? <laughs> Make it sound so jazzy, Bren. <laughs> um, so I absolutely fell into the subject. Again, I seem to have a tendency to falling into things unplanned. But maybe that's the reality of how our lives work. I don't know. Um, right back at the start of lockdown, when we were all trying to find new ways of doing things. And of course, everything then started to um, so many of the events that had been booked to be in person, then came into an online version. And uh, Nudge Stock very quickly adapted and put on their first online behavioral science festival they've subsequently just done their second one which was much more polished um but during the behavioral science festival which i hadn't heard of nudge stock but i knew ogilvy from the advertising yeah. and i was like oh this sounds really interesting i don't know what this is 
but I'm going to sign up. And I was just blown away. It was so interesting. Yeah. It was so different. I'd never come across this before. And yet at the same time, I think a lot of people in behavioral science would say it was new to me, but there were so many aspects of it that were familiar, depending on which field you're coming from. Yeah. But the thing that particularly took me was that I was being introduced to all of these new speakers who had written books. I was like, oh, now they look fantastic. So I started putting together a list in LinkedIn. And it was just a post saying, watching that stock, here's a list of the books of the speakers. And it just gained amazing traction. I was a bit surprised. Uh, as we were watching the Behavioral Science Festival, there's all the fantastic chat going on, which is the way yep. that good online events uh, go these days so that you can get involved. And I put yep. the link in for the book. And in the chat, somebody said, oh, that would make a great subject for a book club. Ah. And yeah, and Prakash Sharma, who's my co-host in Behavioral Science Club, was chatting along and listening to the speakers and saw this conversation going on. Well, unbeknownst to me, Prakash had for a while been looking to, he's a behavioral scientist in India with yeah. a thousand and one stories. Mm. And he'd been looking to do a podcast or do something. So, you know, uh, and he was like, oh, you know, is us what I want to do? And um, when he saw the suggestion of the book club and he saw my interest in the books, he went straight away into LinkedIn and opened up a group in LinkedIn, told me what he'd done. And there were about four of us, like, great, we've got a group. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it very soon took traction. He asked me if I'd managed the group, which I agreed to. And one of the first people who was, chatting with us in the group, Tony Navarra in the States, he said, well, why don't we have as our first book, uh, Alchemy by Rory Sutherland. Yeah. I'd neither heard of Rory Sutherland or he might have been a big shot at the time, but I certainly hadn't heard of him. But he said, well, listen, it was hosted by Ogilvy and told me he was the vice chair of Ogilvy. So I said, fantastic. So we chose Alchemy as our first book in the book club. There's probably about 40 members now, which we thought, wow, this is really great. And um, I just had the idea that Ogilvy, uh, maybe their PR department might like to know that there was a group of enthusiasts who had set up this group. Uh -huh. And because we'd chosen Rory's book, I thought mm, they might be interested in knowing this. So I rambled off an email to PR at Ogilvy. So oh, you might like to know there's 40 enthusiastic people who've chosen Rory's book as their first book. And I suppose this is the thing that escalated it to make it become what it very quickly became, which was through Rory's response to that, Yeah. which was that very quickly he got back to us, told us how flattered he was, he recorded a short video for us, yeah. which stage there were about 100 members. And um, it just really kick-started things because I think I had had no idea or understanding of what a difference it would make to say that our first guest speaker was going to oh, yeah. be Rory Sutherland. Yeah. <laughs> and the kind of uh, kudos that then gave it for other mm. people to say well, it must be something which mm. it wasn't at the time <laughs> yeah so that really really made a difference to have Rory come along as our first speaker and as you know he's a marvelous speaker and we just had a really great time and was that the very first book that you personally read on behavioral science yes that was my introduction to behavioral science and I had it both as the audio book and I had a copy of the book. So yeah, I'd, me go too. Off walk, yeah, I'd go off yeah. walking each day so with Rory in my ears and come back. And his voice is very much present in the book and it's very funny. And he has the yeah. little end notes which so much show his particular personality in the book. Um, but it was a great introduction to the subject. And in many ways, I think, 
took away any of the sort of possibilities of a, a sort of a fear that I might have had about coming into a subject I knew nothing about because he makes the subject so accessible. And once you know that behavioral science is something possibly as simple as relabeling a dish of carrots as uh, crunchy fresh carrots and putting them in the right place as yeah. you approach the uh, salad bar or yeah. the meal bar, once you realize it can be something as simple as that, you just think, oh, well, this is, this is for everybody. And this is such a simple concept complications can be brought into it it can be made much more sophisticated but it's something that we're almost all doing all the time mm. without realizing and it's bringing a science to it to measure it which i just thought oh my god that's just it's just so simple and yet so appealing so it just really took me from the yeah. start i'm just writing a post today about my first book that when i started my behavioral science journey which was actually richard shot in the choice factory and yeah it's just all those lovely wow moments and of the of course of course it's like that those little biases that you just don't even realize are happening absolutely so i wanted to ask you a question about the behavioral science club because um i uh, attempted to join very early on and i got a message from you saying <laughs> saying I'm not we are restricting the membership i know exactly what you're going to say so let me so. just move on yeah let me just move on the story about what happened <laughs> so so we'd got rory along and then i just being completely naive as to how important any of these people were i thought well if rory's coming maybe we'll just invite all the authors and we'll make it much more of a we just thought we were going to chat between ourselves about the books which we still do often but so i just started rattling out emails to cast sunstein and <laughs> as you do and everybody said yes it's like jesus this is fantastic and i think prakash was a little bit shocked about the audacity of it all but uh, still we went with it and uh, as i say between it's been going over a year now we've possibly had only one refusal yeah, one person said no, they couldn't do it. And Who I, was that? Over... God? <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't like to say. <laughs> yeah, I know. I <laughs> but yeah, we've just been overwhelmed by people's willingness to give their time. I mean, we're not completely naive in that we understand that it came at a time when many of the means for promoting uh, books uh, had sort of fallen by the wayside. People yeah. weren't doing their usual circuits, either traveling around and book signing. So here was another opportunity mm. to get in front of their audience. But the situation that you have alluded to there, Bren, was that, as I said, you know, it was 40 members and then it was 100 members. And um, I very much felt that I wanted to have a connection yeah. with the members. And I was recognizing the names as they came up again. And I still do send a personal message to yeah. every person who joins. And uh, we've got over 4,000 members. And as you said, as it reached 500, I had a little bit of a crisis. And with Catherine with Prakash, I was like, oh, my God, you know, all this isn't quite what I thought I was going to be managing. You know, there's all these people, and I feel like I want to be able to have a personal connection with all of them. But how can you have a personal connection with so many people? So Prakash, sort of anticipating that I would well get over this little flutter, said to me, oh, well, you know, do what you have to do, Louise. So I started sending this message, which was the one you received, Bren, which said, that we had thought that we would possibly restrict membership uh, as we'd reached 500 members. Now, you know, all of these various uh, behavioral science um, techniques that people might use to make something appeal, <laughs> appeal more, to say it's restricted, didn't actually cross my mind at the time. But all of a sudden, I was getting all these messages asking basically what people had to do to get into the club. <laughs> 
And somebody even said to me, oh, well, I'm a, a very good friend of Rory, and I'm sure that he can do something about me getting into the club, which we thought was absolutely hysterical. So, um, Well, I did send okay. a plea saying I've read all of these books and I've um, watched all of Rory's YouTube videos, and I so, thought it was yeah, scarcity I'm, I'm, bias, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a few people afterwards seem to suggest that you might have done it on purpose, but it was purely a little bit of a flutter on my kind okay. behind of, of not really feeling that I was back. I was in control of things, but um, uh, Prakash soon uh, explained things to me that don't worry, Louise, you don't need to hold absolutely everybody's hand and know them yeah. all by first name and what their little quirk is. Uh, and, it, and it's just gone from strength to strength. It has. It's a phenomenal success and congratulations for it. And I, like you. you said about, about managing it, I mean, how much time does it take up for you each week? Um, well, we check the group page. I mean, I check it every day because there'd always be another sort of half a dozen people who've asked, can they join? So I don't like to leave people for too long. Mm. But uh, that's not really only a case of then just sort of clicking to let them join. Because I said, then I'd send a message yeah. to them, which gives them all the details about how to join, how to watch it on youtube how to do this how to say that i mean it might be a cut and paste but sometimes you're cutting and pasting it 20 times a day you know so sometimes it takes more time than others and then of course depending on as you know yourself for a podcast depending who the guest is then depends on how much background time you want to spend yeah. preparing to speak it might mean mm. you're reading the person's book it yeah. might mean you're not doing anything else. Or books, absolutely. Yeah. It might mean you're not doing anything more maybe than just checking their profile, reading a few articles just to get a feel for the person. So it depends who the speaker is. But um, well, if, if you're a, a sort of enthusiastic person and keen to learn, it doesn't yeah. seem like it's work in any way because... It's just a pleasure to meet a new person every single week yeah. and learn something new from them. It is. And, but that's, that's something that just really intrigued me about you is because I mean, on, if you follow, if anyone follows you on LinkedIn or Twitter, I mean, my God, the amount of books that you get through, I mean, do you, are you scanning at like light speed? Are you reading every sentence? Every we just book? had a it's conversation incredible. about, yeah, we just had a conversation about this in the, in the house, actually, because I was saying that when you read fiction, well, you can't read it that fast because, you know, a key plot change could come up at the bottom of page 74. And if you miss that, you've missed the whole thing of, of yeah. the story. Mm -hmm. So it's essential when you're reading fiction to really Unless you think, oh, Jesus, this is a lot of description about a few trees. I can scan over that. But it is essential to read the whole book. I don't think that's always the case with, with nonfiction. Mm -hmm. For example, I was saying to my daughter that I was reading a recent book and this, this certain subject came up and then the author started talking about something. And I was like, oh. I, I know what he's talking about. He was giving the example of such and such and such and such. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I know what that is. And in that case, you can skip on a few pages. But it's not so essential to absolutely be reading. Okay. Yeah, every single aspect of the book. But there's only so much you can skim read. I mean, to get mm. the, the gist of a book, you've got to really read most of it. I'm quite a fast reader and always have a book in my hand. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, if, if anyone is a bookworm and they and they want to get into behavioral science and just follow Louise on, on LinkedIn and Twitter because it's, uh, yeah, that's like the bibliography of uh, like. <laughs> um, so, and at, I think maybe at the same time, you kind of got into 42 courses. That was probably through a Rory recommendation, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So the two things go absolutely hand in hand, Bren, which is that as you no 42 courses sponsored both of the online uh festivals for nut stuff yeah. and i'm not sure if i had looked at it before but 
anyway, that certainly gave me the interest to to look it up. And as you say, the most popular course on fortitude courses is Rory's. Or he has a, there's a second one now, which is excellent. Mm which I can recommend to anybody, but um, his original uh, behavioral science course, unfortunately, courses, I think is one of your most popular ones yeah, yeah. and is a fabulous introduction to the subject. And as you say, Bren, once i had done that, I was absolutely hooked. Yeah, because this is a, a, a great reason to talk to you just alone is that you're on the leaderboard, the global leaderboard in the top 10 or top five, no? Yeah, well, I mean, I've had this conversation with um, with Chris, your esteemed boss, Chris Rawlinson, yeah. which is to say to him that I've done a lot of different types of online courses, but none of them are like Fortitude courses. And I really do feel that he has uh, created a very unique style of um of running the courses, of designing them. And as he has explained to me that he couldn't find exactly what he wanted. And so that as opposed to other courses you do, where you start to recognize the format because they're using a design template. He particularly created this for his needs. And, mm. you know, I think it absolutely pays full dividend because for the user of the course, it absolutely ticks all the boxes. You're getting constant feedback from your progress. So you feel that somebody is alongside you. It does have that personal touch because you see the acknowledgement from the person who has marked your particular assignment if it's something that needs to be submitted. Yeah. And if it's not something that needs to be submitted, you can then see the feedback from the other people mm. who have taken part in the course. You can comment at the bottom and create some kind of engagement with them. And I think as well, all of the sort of meta links, as it were, all the other ways in which if you're in a particular chapter that has the links either to watch the uh, TAN winning advertisements or linking to another article. If that's something then that you're interested in, you could yeah. just go off in any yeah. direction. Down the rabbit hole. To, yeah, to particularly look into that area. So the extent to which you use the course is up to you. You can just chug through if that's all you want to take from it. Yeah. But there's so much more potential to create more interest for yourself if that's a particular area you want to develop. Yeah, and I speak to students like on average one a day, actually all around the world, and they all say that exactly the same as that, that it's, it just opens up a world in each course. Mm. Um, uh, well, th thank you thank you for saying that, and Chris will just be <laughs> delighted to hear all that. I mean, actually, I was doing one of the older courses. My, I mean, I work for the company, and I, I was doing one of the courses after work <laughs> last yeah. night. <laughs> It, no escape. <laughs> it, no, but it is really motivating when you finish a lesson and then you get the the meme, you know, and which says like, oh, you've done six correct answers on a row and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, Chris did spend a long time. He spent years, three years researching how to make engaging online, motivating learning. And I, he, he has, he's really cracked it. Yeah, it's um, good stuff. So, but anyway, that's that's not a hard sell. I just wanted to say it because that's how I feel about it. But I wanted to ask you, you've, you've obviously done a lot of the courses because you're on that global top 10. So like, is there one that is like, you wouldn't have thought that was your kind of a subject at first, but then you thought that's a course that, you know, everyone should know about. Is there anything, anyone that you would like to, you know, yeah, say? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's one that particularly jumps out at me, which is the happy course with uh, yeah. is it Mike, Mike Wiking yeah, in yeah. Denmark. Yeah. He, the happiness from, the, from the happiness Institute. And I started that course and even just from the title, I thought, Oh my God, the happy <laughs> course. I thought it was going to be some kind of sort of hippy dippy thing. And I thought, Oh, listen, you know, I'm always open to new things. So oh, I'll look at it. Also, I'd, um, I'd, just before that, I'd 
done the course with, I'm sorry, I've completely forgotten her name, the Yale professor who does the happy course, if you come back to me. Um, and the thing that shocked me about this course was that it was scientific. I was like, straight away, it launches in and the measurements that are taken by this happiness institute in Denmark, the way in which they measure happiness with their surveys consistently year on year, working with other governments. And it sort of took me aback. And uh, it made me realize how even just from the title of the course, I'd completely misconstrued what was involved. And I've recommended it to several people. I actually introduced a colleague of mine to Mike Wyking, and we had a joint call because I was so impressed and said, no, you've got to meet this wow. person. So that was really great. Now, the other one that didn't surprise me in content is the course on, uh, remind me of the name, uh, FinTech, sorry, the FinTech uh -huh. course. Yeah. And again, this surprised me because I didn't expect to be interested in it, but thought I'll do it anyway. Yeah. And I just found it absolutely fascinating. It's a, such a great introduction to the whole concept of just understanding Bitcoin and all of that terminology that we're reading so much about today, mm. but which in a way it's easy to skim over articles and be reading terms that have come into our everyday language through fintech but not actually saying to yourself do i really know what that means <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and realizing oh if somebody asked me maybe i wouldn't be able to explain it and that's exactly what this course does it absolutely takes apart the basic concepts of fintech right from the outset and explains the key terms the concept of mining all of this stuff that you read about and as i say when someone stops you and says hold on a moment you would have to admit no i've actually i've no idea what that's all about uh, and that's exactly what the course does so i'd really recommend that one well wow, great that it opened that door for you as well but you you've sold it to me i haven't done that one yet so i'm going to get into the fintech. oh great Bren. i highly recommend <laughs> it <laughs> um and let's just let's just jump back to behavioral science because um i'm sure people because you're an influencer in the field now like what are the um conferences that might be coming up that you are particularly excited about what about Kilconomics and Kilkenny? Yeah, the funny thing about all of these things is that um, conferences that you thought to yourself, oh, I'd love to go there. Now we all have the opportunity to attend these. And even as we start to reopen and things open in person, most hosts of these events have got the cop on that they've spent possibly two years with virtual audiences and that yeah. they shouldn't say goodbye to yeah. these audiences. Um, during uh, the start of lockdown, I signed up to a lot of the Financial Times online okay. festivals, mm -hmm. which were absolutely fantastic, such a diverse range of speakers. And the, the excitement of being in my office and watching a live conversation with the French president, I was absolutely beyond myself. Wow. I mean, and that, that's, 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 I think that's an example of what we've had the opportunity. I don't know if everybody realizes what a privilege it's been to be able to sign in to an event that would, uh, I would have paid over a hundred sort of euro to attend or more and travel oh, yeah, yeah. and just be able to sit in your office. You are watching these people live, you know, it's not a recording. It's not, it's not even the same as a live interview on television because in most cases, there's a potential that your question could be asked of this person. So I think really it's, 
in a way, if people have engaged with it and taken full uh, advantage of it, it's possibly been a very unique time culturally. I heard somebody call it the third renaissance recently mm. because they were saying, you know, not only have we, we've gone beyond just being sort of a blog that somebody might pick up or a podcast, I mean, that might be picked up, but this whole concept of really being able to engage and create something yourself to just jump on any minute and there we are, you've got an audience. Yeah. It doesn't really matter if there's only 30 people there, you know, you're still able to broadcast an event, be it of live Twitter now, just on sound. Yeah. Um, there's also a new platform set up in India called Mensa. I don't know if you've come across that brand. I've heard of it. But I'm, yeah, I'm... Mensa. Yeah, so we had the host on Behavioral Science Club, and this is another sort of concept, a little bit like Clubhouse, mm. but it's only 20 minutes. Mm. And I, it's, it's like the Twitter or Clubhouse. Because, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. you just jump on, you can talk about anything for 20 minutes. And I think it's all part of this sort of, you know, this, this renaissance. You feel like, if you feel anything's possible, really, which is a really great, liberating feeling. I'm waiting for the platform that comes on and you have to do a conference in 20 seconds, then I'll, I'll join. <laughs> <it. laughs> yeah, we'll all join that one, Brent. <laughs> Okay. Um, and final word, like you put a lot of energy, commitment, focus, all of that into the Behavioral Science Club and, and you have had this fantastic success from it. But what, what do you get back from it as a reward? Because we're, we're really interested in at 42 Courses. We're, we're in the background, in the far future, we're doing like a course on resilience and all this kind of stuff. You know, these the next century skills that people need and empathy and all this, it's all involved in what you're doing. So, but it's so rewarding, I, I'm sure, right? What, what do you get back from it? Well, I think that to be describing it as what do I get back from it, you know, that's when you start doing something, you don't go into it. You know, when it's your job, you're getting paid, but you don't mm. go into something. You don't pick up a book and say, what am I going to get out of it? <laughs> you know, so that's the reality of how humans are. But, you know, if I say to somebody, well, I'm uh, co-hosting this group where every Saturday we get to meet a new person and I have the privilege of uh, introducing them to uh, another sort of 60 people who have attended. I can ask them whatever they want and uh, it might be that I read their book. If for somebody to then still be saying, well, what do you get out of that? You know, it just speaks for itself, the privilege. Mm. Uh, of of being able to speak with these people when you yourself consider yourself to they're like <laughs> why should they give me their time why mm. should they and so I think it sort of just speaks for itself and it, it's the learning aspect of it you know we should as people never be closed off you know to to learning new things and when somebody says they feel they know all there is to know about a subject well woe betide that person because mm. you know people who think they know everything are the very people who uh, you know don't know anything and until we say and acknowledge that we don't know anything you know there's no you know that's that's the, that's the time at which you can start to go forward and start to learn when you acknowledge that you know nothing yeah. Um, and maybe it was a benefit to me to come into the subject knowing absolutely nothing. Mm. I was a real tabula rasa, as it were. And so, you know, nothing could be too much information when you have nothing to base it on at all. Yeah. Great stuff. And it's, I have to say, Louise, it's been a real privilege speaking to you. I, I love following your stuff on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks so I, much. I wish I could go to more actual behavioral science club live, but Saturday is a bit sacred for me and my wife, and I'm not allowed to kind of like be in doing work as it were. So. Absolutely. We totally I like watching them on YouTube. That. Oh, thank you yeah. so much. Thanks so much. And yeah, we're just 
we're just grateful that people still turn up every week to join us. We have regular people, obviously, who we recognize now who've been joining us. You then notice other people sort of come away for, for a little while and then they might spring back and it's really great to see them and always new people joining and who knows how long things will last we're in a very strange time mm. maybe people will completely lose the run of themselves and say well look i'm absolutely sick of going online on a saturday it's the last thing i want to do so so you know you never know. have a definite period of time and um, if it's something that comes to an end so be it but whilst we're all enjoying it we well you're having a great enjoy, run enjoy it for the time that it, that's in it yeah that's my yeah. attitude long may it succeed thank Louise, you so much friend thank you so much been such a great time talking to you really inspiring thanks. And, uh, Thanks so much, Brent. Continued success with the Behavioural Science Club and 42 courses from new courses. <laughs> Thank, thanks, super. And anyone listening who wants to join us in Behavioural Science Club, we meet every Saturday, 4 p.m. UK time for one hour. I try to be strict with the time, but Prakash <laughs> likes to always ask our guests, do you mind staying for another 15 minutes or so? So we never quite want to finish. Um, and we're a LinkedIn group. So if you just go onto LinkedIn and search Behavioural Science Club, then you'll find the group and our click you through to join. So thanks so much, Brent. It's been an absolute privilege talking I'll, to you today and lovely. I'll Thank put all the link in the show notes. I'll put the link in the show notes for everything. Yeah. Thanks so much, Brent. Thanks, great. Really, really, really great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye now. So if you go onto LinkedIn, it's Behavioural Science Club, and that's behavioural with the English spelling with O-U in the spelling there. And on Twitter, they are at B-C-I Club, B-E-H-S-C-I Club. So follow Louise and Prakash there and go along to their Saturday sessions on Zoom to see the absolute top speakers in behavioural science. And thanks for listening today. Until next time.